Okay, thanks, Amit. Everyone can hear me? Good. Um, so it's been about uh, 30 years since garbled circuits came out of the scene in the, in the 80s. Maybe it's a good time to sit back and, and see where we've been. And I think garbled circuits, uh, well, 2PC, MPC in general, garbled, garbled circuits specifically, uh, have been a real success story for crypto. And that's kind of the story that I want to tell uh, today um, in terms of uh, practical adoption of, of these crypto techniques. I'm just going to start right out and I'm going to show uh, technical, all the technical details in this talk because they're, they're, they're simple, they're easy to understand and they're elegant. Um, I think everyone can appreciate them. So I'm going to start off um, right away and refresh everyone's memory about garbled circuits. Right? This is, a, this is like, I don't know, your first lecture in, the, in some grad crypto course. So here is a, a Boolean circuit. Uh, this is actually some sort of comparison circuit. I actually, I, I worked it out. It took me, <laughs> it took me a significant amount of time. But this is a, this is some sort of a comparison circuit, uh, comparing two uh, two bit numbers. Um, I, f I forget how it works now. But um, each uh, each gate in the circuit is associated with the, a truth table. Um, I had to look up the symbols for the, it was a disaster. Um, the, there is a knot here. The, the little bubble is a knot, right? So you see this, this is this negates the first wire. So you see the the, the true is yeah. So good, um, it's all coming back to us now. So uh, the idea to garble a circuit is for each wire in the circuit, we'll pick two uh, <laughs> two random crypto keys. I'll call them wire labels. Uh, so uh, a zero wire label and a one wire label on each wire. Um, the wire label with the subscript 0 is going to correspond to false, and the, the subscript 1 is going to correspond to true. And so every place that in the truth tables replace the, the uh, semantic values with these uh, abstract wire labels as encodings of true and false. And the big idea is to encrypt each gate. So I will encrypt, for example, the output wire label using a pair of input wire labels. That means if you, if you know A0 and B0, that's like false, false, then you should learn the output wire label for false. And we'll do that for every single, uh, every single gate in the circuit. This is what we get. And so this collection of uh, four ciphertexts per gate in the circuit, I'll call that the garbled circuit. So this is a big cryptographic uh, bundle of information. And we can encode uh, truth values with a garbled encoding. So up here is, a, is an encoding of, let's, let's say, 1001 on these wires. So I'll just pick the, the appropriate wire label for each wire. That's a garbled encoding along a wire. And so now what this allows you to do, if you know the garbled circuit and you know a garbled encoding of the input, then what we observe is that for each gate, you should, you should only be able to open exactly one of these ciphertexts. And then you'll learn exactly one wire label for each, uh, for the output wire. That's the invariant. You'll learn exactly one label for each wire. And we can go through. I spent a lot of time on this slide, so I'll, 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 let, I'll let you see all, all of my hard work. Um, <laughs> there's a mistake, by the way. There's a mistake? No. There's... <laughs> Okay, we'll talk offline. Um, okay, so we we eventually get a garbled uh, we eventually get a garbled uh, encoding of the output. It's false in this case, um, whatever that means with respect to the inputs. So that's uh, that's the basic. This is the baseline classical uh, Yao's garbled circuit construction, and we love garbled circuits. Uh, the classical application of which is uh, secure two-party computation. So Alice and Bob have their private inputs. Uh, Alice can generate a garbled circuit. She can send the garbled uh, encoding of her input. So the circuit has input wires for Alice and for Bob. She sends the garbled encoding of her input. She sends the, the, uh, all, all the wire labels for the, uh, for the output wires. Um, we need to arrange for Bob to pick up a garbled encoding of his input. And that's easy to do with uh, one out of two oblivious transfer. Um, so that's really nice. And once Bob has uh, the garbled circuit and the garbled uh, encoding of the input, he can evaluate the circuit. He can decode it with the output wire labels and send back the result. This is a secure protocol uh, in the presence of semi-honest adversaries. Um, and there are many, many more applications of garbled circuits, uh, both in theory and in practice. Uh, I stole this list from uh, the Bilare Huang Ragaway paper. Um, and they really recognized uh, that 
the process of garbling a computation should be recognized as like a fundamental cryptographic primitive, you know, just like a block cipher is a fundamental primitive. Um, that really kind of reflects how important this uh, primitive has been um, in the last 30 years. So uh, here's the, the syntax of, of garbling uh, as a fundamental primitive. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'll just say a little bit about the security properties. It's important to understand what we're aiming for. Um, maybe the most important one is that if I give you a garbled circuit and a garbled input and this uh, decoding information, then you learn nothing beyond the output of the circuit. And that's the important property that we need in the, in the 2PC YAOS protocol. There are some other properties. Uh, one that I'll talk to about, one that I'll talk about later is authenticity. If I just give you a garbled circuit and a garbled input, but I don't, I, I withhold the decoding information, then it should be hard for an adversary to generate a valid garbled output other than the one that he's uh, supposed to supposed to get. So he sh it should be hard to falsify the uh, the, the output. Uh, so those are the security properties that we're after, and so the 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 focus of this talk is uh, is optimizations of garbled circuits throughout the years, and there are different parameters that we can think of optimizing. We could optimize the hardness assumption that's uh, the size of the garbled circuit, the the number of ciphertexts that are sent per gate, um, and also the cost of computation. And in this talk, I'll really focus on the size, just as an objective metric. Um, and this is uh, this is borne out in practice. Most of these applications of garbled circuits, we find that uh, the communication overhead is the major bottleneck. And so, reducing the size. Um, is really the key factor. I'll talk a little bit about computation also, and I will not care about the hardness assumption um, at all for this, the purposes of this talk. Yeah, Adam. Does, does expressiveness of the, of the circuit language, does that count in size? Or, you know, if you, if you allow a different type of circuit, like an arithmetic circuit or something? Like that? Um, so the, the, the practical instantiations of garbling are just Boolean circuits, and there are theoretical constructions uh, for arithmetic circuits that are more of a heavy machinery they use lattices and stuff. So I won't focus on that. In fact, I'll focus, when I say size, I, I'm actually talking about concrete, uh, concrete size of things that are implemented in practice. There are, there are lots of things in, in crypto, like uh, functional encryption, that, you can, that you, can, you can express as a garbled circuit in this framework. They have asymptotically better size but the constants are huge. They use heavy machinery like FHE and obfuscation. And so I'll really focus on the, the Boolean circuits, um, the Boolean circuit constructions. Um, so that's kind of my baseline. OK, so this graph kind of tells, this is the story that I want to tell with this talk. This is the average number of bits per gate that you need to garble different circuits. So to garble the AES circuit uh, back in 1990, it took four times, uh, four times the security parameter. That was the cost per gate uh, to garble the AES circuit. And now the cost is, I think it's like 0.4 times the security parameter, uh, average number of bits that you need per gate in the AES circuit. Um, and so I want to tell the story of how we got from, from the dotted portion of the line uh, where no one knew anything and to, to the current state of the art. Um, that means I would talk about. Uh, minus security parameter, you mean sort of practical parameter that leads to two to the minus lambda security, or what, what, what do you mean by security? So, yeah, security parameter, think of, think of it as the length of the, the wire labels. No, no, but I mean, how does it relate to security? I mean, if you, if you assume that uh, AES is like two to the minus 128 security, oh. yeah. That's right. Yeah. But also the garbling security. You, you're comparing these with the same level of security, all the, the different uh, examples. Yeah, this is this is the just the size of the garbled circuit, and so that's kind of a it can be a really fair comparison with the same security parameter. Would it be that if you take say the plain constructions, they have tighter security and therefore allow you to use a shorter uh, symmetric primitive than the, the, the best constructions? Well, uh, 
there are possible attacks against the, the most heavily optimized variants uh, that, that do not exist. Uh, if you look at the... Yeah, okay, I understand the question. I don't think there's, among the constructions that I'll show, I don't think there's very much difference at all in the, you know, the reason that we're getting these improvements doesn't really show up in the security proof in terms of like introducing extra slack in the in the reduction, if that's what you're asking. So I think this, the slack in the security reduction is 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 pretty equivalent between all of these. Um, I thought I'd make a really bold prediction. If you, you know, this is kind of a linear, this is kind of a straight line, and so if you if you extrapolate, I think. 2026 <laughs> is going to be a great year to be studying crypto, and then all garbled circuits will, will cost nothing. So, um, so, so watch for the proceedings of crypto 2026. Um, uh, maybe that's when AES is broken. <laughs> yeah, when AES is broken, then the secure protocol is just I send my input. Right? So, good. good, yeah. Hugo will have the... Uh, Google 2026. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so like I said, I want to get into the actual details of these constructions. Um, one thing that uh, I glossed over in my first slide was that um, I didn't talk about the position of these ciphertexts uh, within these, these four ciphertexts. The relative position leaks information. For example, if you end up opening the third ciphertext, then it's the third row of the truth table. That's a zero because we all know what this gate is. Um, that means in the classical construction, we have to permute these four ciphertexts. Um, and that means that when you evaluate, you have to trial decrypt uh, all four of them, and you have to identify when you've decrypted successfully. Right? You have to know when you found the single ciphertext that you're supposed to be able to open. Um, and I looked and I couldn't find that anyone knew what uh, Yao had in mind. It was a theoretical construction after all. I, who knows how, how much he thought this would be in practice in the year 2015. Um, but the, the GMW paper has a, 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 an account of garbled circuits. They use actually public key uh, crypto to instantiate these uh, ciphertexts in the garbled circuit. Uh, later, Lyndall and Pincus had a, uh, they, they wrote a paper that was a formal proof of, of Yao's construction. They chose to do like a nested encryption. Uh, it was symmetric encryption, but it, um, it had the property that you could tell whether you, you were decrypting successfully. Um, I think the public key crypto in the GMW paper was so that there were public keys floating around, so you could tell when you got the correct secret key. That's my guess, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. Um, I couldn't find anyone who knew what really happened. Um, um, it was just to make sure that this is important. <laughs> just to make sure it stayed theoretical. I guess it had to do with assumptions. Hmm? Did you ask Yao? Did you ask uh, Jay <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's what I wanted. I think they said Okay. Good. Mystery solved. <laughs> what did Shafi say? Shafi said that it was because of the, the public key to verify the secret key was. Uh, so, Hugo is PhD thesis says that it's pretty accurate. Yeah, Rogaway was, was who I emailed, actually. And, uh, OK. Um, OK, but we're not focusing on the, the public key aspect anyway. Um, we don't need public key. Um, so the so I want to start uh, so everything is kind of murky at this point. Uh, I want to start uh, rattling off these different optimizations. They're very they're very nice and elegant. Uh, um, so here's the the first one. Uh, so Beaver Macaulay Rogaway in 1990 uh, had this observation. They said uh, so here's a here's a garbled gate. For each wire in for each wire label, we'll assign it a random color. Um, and the two wire labels for e the two labels for each wire of opposite color, and the color is kind of it's randomly associated. Sometimes the false gets red, sometimes false gets blue. So the color is totally independent of the semantic value, um, and will include the color in the wire label itself. Usually, is the last uh, bit of the wire label. So if you hold a wire label in your hand, you can see what color it is. Um, and now look at these four ciphertexts. You have all four different combinations of the uh, of the two. Uh, of the red blue colors, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to canonically order these four ciphertexts. So in my world, red red is always first, red blue is 
is always second. I'm always going to order the four ciphertext uh, in that way. And that means when you, hold, uh, when you hold an input to this gate, you'll see what colors it is. Here you have uh, blue, red. And in my world, that's always the third ciphertext. You always go straight to the third ciphertext and decrypt it. Um, you don't have to do a trial decryption of all four. You don't have to have extra redundancy in these uh, ciphertexts to tell whether you've decrypted the right one. Um, in fact, it allows these uh, ciphertexts to be really cryptographically simple objects. They only need the simple one-time security, uh, like, a, uh, like a simple one-time pad, essentially. And so I want to take a little tangent and talk about the different instantiations that you can use for these, uh, for these gate level uh, encryptions. Um, maybe one of the earliest one was from Naur, Pincus, and Sumner using, uh, using two PRFs in this way. So here, uh, A and B are the input, uh, the, the wire labels of the input wires. C is the payload. It's the wire label of the output uh, label of that circuit uh, or of that gate. Um, let's see. So here is kind of the, the first one. And Fairplay was the first implementation of Yao's garbled circuit. They used this, uh, this encryption. They used SHA-256 as a PRF. And they didn't run their implementation on AES, but I extrapolated. I think it would take about six seconds using 2004 hardware. This is a totally unfair comparison. I'm talking about running times from things from different, from, from different years. It's not a fair comparison, but it, just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude of these things. So a couple seconds to, to garble an AES circuit um, here. Um, well, one hash is always better than two hashes, I guess. And so another thing you could do is you could take a hash, you model it as a random oracle, let's say, um, and just hash everything together. You know, use that as a, as a mask to the payload. Uh, this was uh, suggested by Lyndall Pincus and Smart. Uh, there's an implementation from uh, Shellot and Shen in 2012. They used 250, SHA-256 here. Um, I mean, it's eight years later. Hardware is faster. Um, and now this is like tenths of a second to garble AES. Um, but we know that uh, implementing uh, implementations of block ciphers are faster than hash functions. So let's try to use a block cipher. Um, well, you can use AES-256. This is kind of convenient. You have a 256-bit key, which is like two wire labels, and the block itself is, is 128. It's like one wire label. Uh, that's significantly fast. Well, it's a non-trivial amount faster. It's like 30% faster um, because you can use uh, hardware-accelerated AES instructions. Um, but then these are kind of blown out of the water. Uh, so Bilar et al. have, uh, they observed that the, the major cost in using AES is the key schedule. And so what if we can get rid of the key schedule altogether? That should be faster. Um, so let's use AES with a constant key and use this construction. They proved it was a secure thing to plug in. Um, it's kind of a non-standard assumption to make about AES. It assumes that uh, when, you fix, uh, when you fix a, public, uh, a publicly known constant as the AES key, the thing that you get should look like an ideal permutation. This is a, so kind of the flavor of an ideal cipher assumption on AES, uh, but the results are, are pretty staggering. So now we're now we're in the mic measuring the cost to, to garble the whole AES circuit in, in microseconds. Let me uh, ask a question before you said that the, the bottleneck is communication rather than computation. So this applies. Yeah, this is just. Yeah, this is like the one slide I have about computation. Um, just the. <laughs> the, the ANSI standard for seconds, I don't think, has changed. <laughs> I mean, th these are the seconds that were reported in, in this paper, extrapolated. So the, the hardware is, we, we're, we can take credit for advances in hardware, right? Crypto's gotten better because advances in hardware, and that's kind of folded so into this slide. If you just measure stuff in seconds, is my question. Oh, it's totally not fair, but I mean, I don't think hardware advances have accounted for the entirety of this improvement. That's maybe my point. But yeah, this is totally unfair. That's why I also want to focus on size for the rest of the talk, which is a <coughs> legitimately fair comparison. Somewhat out of curiosity, I mean, how easy is to use those skins? Because in principle, if it was like really trivial to use to make a fair comparison, you would just like you know click a button and just recompute it like this year, 
Because my understanding, one of the things is like public key cryptography, the reason it's not used is like these libraries are super painful to use. It's like, or, or is it getting to the level where you just click a button, install, and uh, can run it? Uh, the implementation in this paper is 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 pretty simple. You, you push a button, you you give it a circuit, out pops a garbled circuit. Um, but they, they only implemented this. Uh, uh, right. They only instantiated their encryption with this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a to you guys who actually do the actual work, but I mean, it might be actually a good thing to make sure yeah. that not just you do something for your paper, but for people to use so then you, know, you can make fair comparisons and actually use it in real yeah. life. Yeah, so speaking of fair comparison, the next talk in the program is from Yehuda. Uh, his talk will give like another data point here and maybe a little bit more comparison, not like an entire summary of the entire history of the world, but uh, more comparisons here and focusing on the hardness assumption here uh, and the trade-off. Yeah. Um, in your previous slide, you No, see, blue blue is true here and false here. So the, the the color is chosen randomly apart from the semantic value. Yeah. Yeah, it's independent of the semantic value, so it can be the basis of ordering the, the, the four sets. Okay, good. Um, so this is all I wanted to say about computation. I want to focus on on the reduction in garbled circuit size. Uh, here's our here's our baseline. Uh, I want to focus mostly on this first column. Uh, how big is a is a is a cipher is a garbled circuit? Uh, the classical construction, I don't know. It's probably pretty big. The, the ciphertexts have some redundancy, maybe some public key mechanisms. Point and permute. Um, we have four ciphertexts per uh, <coughs> per garbled gate. Okay, so it seems like you know there's four possible input combinations to the gate. How could anything? Be cheaper than that. Um, so here is the, you know, the, the first hole in in the wall that get us breaking through. Uh, now our Pinkus and Sumner had this idea of row reduction, and the idea is pretty simple. So I described garbled circuits where for each uh, wire you choose the true and false wire labels randomly. But what if we don't choose them randomly? What if there's a better way of choosing these wire labels? So what we'll do is we'll look at the, these four ciphertexts. We'll see what uh, ciphertext is the first one. Like the red, red one is always the first one. What will be the payload of that ciphertext? In this case, it's C1. So instead of choosing C1 randomly, I'll choose C1 to be the value that, when encrypted, causes this first ciphertext to be 0. Right? That's what this says. The value that, when encrypted under A0, B1, gives me all zero ciphertext. I can do that because this is just like a, this encryption is like generate a pseudo-random mask and do a one-time pad. So this E is like a, is a, is a, is like a permutation. I can, it's legitimate for me to write this. Um, so now the first cipher, I'll, I'll choose C1 in that way always. That'll always make the first ciphertext all zeros. I don't have to send it now. We just have to agree that uh, if you get red, red, you should just imagine the all zero ciphertext. Um, and I don't have to send it. Um, so that's maybe surprising. Like, wow, four seemed like the, the reasonable number for a garbled circuit. Now we can do three. Now, now we really get our wheels moving and thinking maybe, maybe in, by 2026 everything will be free. <laughs> um, OK, so we'll update our scoreboard. Uh, we went from four to three. That's garbled row reduction uh, three, which is suggested. There may be other kinds of row reduction that are not three. Um, can you explain the other two columns there? Sorry, what's the garbled? How do you okay, so the garbled, the cost to garble, um, the cost to garble. Oh, this is confusing. So when you garble the circuit, you still have to perform this, 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 this. You do four calls to the to this encryption, and the cost to evaluate is we're using point and permute. You just have to find uh, find the correct place and, and then then uh, then decrypt that. So depending on whether you're using this hash instantiation or pseudo-random function, uh, four calls to the hash if you're using that instantiation, or eight calls to the PRF. And then to evaluate, uh, one call to the hash, two calls to the PRF. Um, but that won't be the main focus. I really want to, I really want to, I'm excited, more excited about this column, I guess. Um, OK, it's 2008 now. In the meantime, fair play 
uh, has been the first implementation of garbled circuits. And so people are starting to think, well, maybe this, there's something to this. Maybe we can implement this, and it can actually be practical. Uh, so Kolesnikov and Schneider had this idea of free XOR. So I've drawn an XOR gate, if you're not familiar with the uh, circuit symbols. That's an XOR gate. And instead of writing the wire labels as I have been, I'll write them in this way. So there's the false wire label is A, and the true one is A plus some offset. So every wire has an offset. I can always write things in this form. Um, these three wires maybe have different offsets. But the idea behind free XOR is make all of the wires have the same offset. Uh, so there's a common delta for all of the wires. So it's false is A, B, and C. True is A plus delta, B plus delta, C plus delta. And what does that buy us? Instead of choosing the output wire label randomly, I'll choose it to just be the XOR of the two false output wire labels. And now what, what happens? Suppose I have exactly one label here and one label here, and I XOR them together. I XOR the false and false, I get the false wire label. False and true, I get the true wire label. True and false, I get true. True and true, the two deltas cancel out. It's XOR, and I get false. I get the semantics of, of XOR. And all the evaluator had to do was XOR the two wire labels together. Um, the, me, as the generator of the garbled circuit, didn't have to send anything at all. The XOR gate was totally free of communication, it was free of computation, if, it, if you consider an XOR of strings to be free. Um, so that's great. That's, that's how we do XOR gates. Um, let's make sure we haven't broken. What's that? <coughs> so the delta is random. It's a secret that the generator of the garbled circuit knows. Oh, okay. So you get something you don't know if it's plus. I, mean, I guess you don't know if it's plus delta if you don't know. Yeah, you, you, you get this bundle. You don't know. You use the same delta for all gates, right? Yeah, you have to use the same delta for all gates because you want every wire that touches an XOR gate to look like this. Um, so this is how you garble XOR gates. Let's make sure we haven't broken the other kinds of gates. So we still have to garble other kinds of gates, like here's an AND gate. And if I garble it, I'll get this kind of a table. I can still do row reduction uh, to change it from four to three ciphertexts. So that's good. But I want you to look closely at these ciphertexts. Delta is the secret that's known only to the garbler. It's not known to the evaluator. And it's appearing as a key and also as a payload of these ciphertexts. And that means we need some kind of a circularity assumption for this to work. So whatever, however we instantiate this uh, gate level encryption scheme, there needs to be some kind of a circularity assumption. So just think of delta as a, as a secret. Um, so. If, if we're using random oracles, this is fine. Um, this is, we haven't broken anything, but it's just something to be aware of. Yeah. What does it do to a circuit if you have to, like, now you have to find, like, find a representation of the circuit that really maximizes the number of XOR gates and how? And yes. Like, is that well understood? It's, uh, it's NP hard, right? Uh, Claudio, you gave a nice rum session talk about this paper that no one knows about. About no, but you said it's, it's, it's everyone knows about it. Okay, <laughs> you all know it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, this this leads to a incentive to make circuits with as few AND gates as possible, and um, people do this. I, I don't. I think it's it's an NP hard problem to optimize the number of AND gates for sure, or co NP hard or something. Um, but yeah, actually, the the improvement in that first graph that I showed. The reason AES is such an uh, amazing looking line in that graph is because people have done this for AES. The AES garbled circuit is like 80% XOR gates, um, which means it's 80% free. So, in, in, before we get to the free XOR, we're hiding what every gate was. And now we're telling you where, where all the XOR gates are. So, it's security? security. That's true. So, it, throughout this whole thing, I'm assuming that both parties know the circuit. And that's a fair assumption for the, the 2PC application. We both agree on the circuit that we're evaluating. But here, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, I'm asking the evaluator to do different things when he gets to an XOR gate versus an AND gate. And before, I could sort of disguise the truth table of the gate. Um, so for some applications, maybe you're right, the free XOR is not appropriate. But um, for most applications, this is, this is all right. But, but yeah, that's a good observation.
Yeah, if you really care, you can use a universal circuit. Um, no, but it would be probably better to use the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Alessandro? So, which means that the previous P and P and GRR, that they don't need random mode Right. Um, yeah, these can be done just with PRF. And I think the, the focus of Yehuda's talk is about the, the assumption that you use. So think of FreeXOR as requiring random oracle. That's, that's a good first approximation. These two don't. Um, yeah, Yehuda's talk is about how much do you have to trade off if you, uh, uh, if you don't want random oracle, you want standard assumptions. <coughs> <laughs> don't miss it. Um, OK, so three ciphertext is, is great. Um, uh, but three is such a big number, why can't we do two? So here, uh, so Pincus said I'll have this really clever idea to, to garble a gate with just two ciphertexts. Um, and this is actually the most complicated, uh, the most complicated construction, uh, but it's still simple, everyone can understand it. So there's, imagine the four different uh, possible input combinations you could have to this gate, the input wire labels, and use them to derive four different keys. So if you know A0, B0, you'll be able to get key K1. You'll, you'll be able, to, as the evaluator, you'll only be able to get exactly one of those. I want to set things up so that if you learn, let's say, K2, you should learn C1, which is the true output wire label, uh, and so on. So how can I arrange that for, for that to happen? Let's take all the ones that should let you learn 0. So K1, K3, K4. I'm going to think of them as, as points in, in a finite field, uh, GF2 to the N. Uh, there's a unique degree 2 polynomial passing through these points. I'll call it P. And let's take the other point, K2, and I'll strangely take P5 and P6. Those are three points. There's a unique degree 2 polynomial passing through those. Let's call it Q. Now I have polynomials that are red and blue. I'm going to choose the output wire labels to be P0 and Q0, so the zero points of these polynomials. And I'm going to choose the garbled like the garbled gate, to be P5 and P6. This is the information that I'm going to give you as part of the garbled circuit. I claim that this works. Uh, so if you're evaluating this garbled circuit, what do you do? Um, let's suppose you have A1, B0. So that means you'll be able to learn uh, K3. Right? They have A1, B0. You learn K3, so you know K3, you know P5 and P6. You'll interpolate. You'll get the red polynomial in this case, evaluate that polynomial at 0, and yes, that's exactly the false output wire label. That's what you're supposed to learn. If instead you had had A0, B1, you would learn K2, you would interpolate, you would get the blue polynomial, you would evaluate it at 0, you get the true output wire label. That's what you're supposed to learn. So when you see the whole picture now, it kind of makes sense. Right? You have, always have these two points. If you take interpolate with any one of these four, you'll get either the red or the blue polynomial with exactly the semantics of what this uh, gate is supposed to be. Um, so before you talk, does anybody, did anybody know about this paper? Or is it like a well-known paper? <laughs> Benny knew about it. <laughs> Yehuda knew. Yehuda knew. So black people know? I know. More people than who understand obfuscation are not testing. This goes through with just a PRF. Um, you, you, have to, you have to understand like secret sharing now to do the proof, but it's not so bad. Even I've written the proof. <laughs> the, the one problem with this approach, so we got, uh, we got a garbled gate down to two ciphertexts now. Um, this is for an AND gate. You can do a similar thing for XOR gate. The, well, the problem is you can't do free XOR now. Free XOR means you need the, the two output wire labels to have an XOR of delta. But now you really have no control over C0, C1. You can't ensure that they always have an XOR of delta. So this is incompatible with uh, free XOR. Uh, that's too bad. So now, now we can do any gate for 2, or we can do free XOR and do 0 and 3. And I really don't like this, because now there's like, sometimes free XOR is better, sometimes this row reduction is better. So this, only re this can be done just with the PRF. Um, so if you care about assumptions, you might prefer this. Um, and 
I think, I don't know if it's in their paper, but I think addressing your question, I think with this two ciphertext thing, you can obscure the, the truth table of the gate. So I, 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 I think that's probably true. Um, so if you, if, you, if you need that property as well. OK, so let's fast forward to last year, or rewind to last year, whichever your point of reference is. Um, so the Flexor paper was with uh, myself and, and Vlad and, and Payman. And we wanted to sort of we wanted to sort of find something that was you know better than both of these, and so here is one idea we had. So here's a wire in a circuit all by itself. It has an offset of delta one, and suppose I'm not really happy with this delta one offset. I'd prefer if it was a delta two offset. I want to transfer the delta one offset into a delta two offset because maybe delta two is be a, a more convenient offset for me, you know, downstream of this wire. So I can imagine that there is a unary identity gate. I had to look this one up for sure. Like this is a buffer gate. Uh, uh, you're used to seeing this with a little bubble at the end. That's a not gate. So without the bubble, it's just a buffer gate. <laughs> if you learn anything from this talk, maybe you learned this. <laughs> Remember the symbols of the uh, of wiring. Okay. So this is a unary identity gate. It's a truth table is really simple, and I'll just do what I have always done. I'll encrypt. Uh, encrypt the output wire label using the appropriate input wire label. Um, so that's good. That cost me two ciphertexts. Oh, but wait, I don't really care what A star is. So instead of choosing A star at random, I'll choose it to be the thing that makes this first ciphertext go away. Uh, good. So I can, I can translate the offset of a wire to anything I want using just one ciphertext. I'll use this little uh, notation for that. So delta 1 to delta 2 means this gadget. So at a cost of one ciphertext, I change the uh, uh, I change the offset of a wire. Okay, let's let's revisit an XOR gate. So, yeah. And, uh, I don't think we ever want it to be necessarily related. So, um, it could it could though. I think the proof would go through. Um, so let's revisit an, an XOR gate. Here, these three wires touching the gate have different uh, offsets. If they all had the same offset, I would do uh, free XOR, but they don't. And for some reason, that's going to be beneficial for me. I want them to be, have different offsets. Um, but I guess just for the purposes of this XOR gate, one thing I could do is just translate these uh, offsets into delta C, which is where I, the output should be. These each cost one ciphertext, and now these two wires, like really touching the XOR gate, have delta C offset. They all have the same offset. This is a free XOR, and so the total cost here, oh, the total cost here is one ciphertext for each of these adjustments, and then the XOR is free. So this whole little contraption has two a cost of two ciphertexts, um, which doesn't seem like we're making progress. Um, but on the other hand, if if this wire was already suitable for me, if it was already the offset that I wanted, then I don't have to do anything. And now this, this XOR gate costs 1. And if this guy was already delta C, I don't have to do anything. It just collapses to free XOR. So overall, I can do an XOR gate at a cost of 0, 1, or 2 ciphertext. And it depends on how many of these offsets are distinct. Um, right? I want many of them to collide. And this gets us to a combinatorial optimization problem. I want to figure out an offset to give to each wire to minimize the total cost of the XOR gates. But I can also throw in an additional constraint that allows us to be compatible with the two ciphertext row reduction for the AND gates. Right? So this is what I do for XOR gates. For AND gates, I'll do the PSSW paper with, the, with two ciphertexts. Um, and I just get this combinatorial optimization problem to make the, the, the XOR gates as, as minimal as possible. Um, our paper does some other things too, but this this is the important thing we do in, in terms of the size of the garbled circuit. Um, so we can get an AND gate at a cost of two. We can get an XOR gate for either zero, one, or two, depending on some uh, structural properties of the circuit. And usually it's a zero or a one. And so in practice, we tried a bunch of circuits. It does seem to be better. It uses the ideas of free XOR, so it has the same uh, the circularity. Uh, problem is free XOR, uh, but it's a little bit smaller, uh, or significantly smaller in some cases. Okay, we're nearing the finish line. Uh, I still have some time. That's good. Um, 
So the latest and greatest is uh, some joint work with uh, Sami, who's here. Say hi to him and, and David Evans. Um, it's this idea called half gates. And I'll start out with this totally philosophical question, like, well, let's imagine that the garbler knows in advance that on one wire, for example, this wire, I'm garbling a circuit. I know in advance you will get the false wire label. Maybe, maybe that will be helpful. Um, spoiler alert, it will be helpful. Um, <laughs> Um, OK, so I know that you're going to get the false wire label here. That means this AND gate collapses to, it'll always output 0, right? You've got a false input to an AND gate. So I could just, if I knew that you were always having the false wire label, I could just garble this uh, unary gate that always outputs 0. It looks like this, right? Um, if I knew that you were going to get true, then this gate becomes an identity gate. Right. If you set uh, one wire of an AND gate to true, you get an identity gate that's the residual. I could, I could garble that in that case. Right? So the garbler knows whether he's here or here. Somehow, we've, we've assumed that the garbler knows whether he's in the left case or the right case. He'll do the right thing. Um, let me collapse these two, and I'll just, I'll just write, uh, I'll write it like this. Okay? So uh, that's good. I'll, I can use this idea of row reduction. Instead of choosing C at random, I'll choose C to make this first ciphertext disappear. Good, this cost, me, this cost me a total of one ciphertext. So the answer is, you know, the question is, what if the garbler knows in advance uh, what uh, wire label the evaluator will hold? The answer is, well, that means we can just get away with one ciphertext. Um, why we should care about that, I'll get to. Um, I'm hiding the details of the point and permute because because if I back up, these two ciphertexts are permuted according to their color bits. We, we do the right thing. To, uh, it's, it's not difficult, but you have to do that. Um, so I'm confused. If the evaluate, the card already knows, uh, you're saying the recipient doesn't know? Why, why don't you just can get rid of the gate if it's identity for the previous uh, label? I mean, just collapse the circuit. Why do you need to still do this stuff? Yeah, you have, to, you have to trust me that it'll all work out in the end. No, but why, why, why <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, why don't you just collapse this before garbling? So you're saying, if you know the result of this wire, I, 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 I suggest <laughs> yeah. yeah, only the garbler knows. The evaluator doesn't. But I'm going to ask the complementary question. Uh, what if only the evaluator knows one input to a wire? And then I'll combine these two at the end, and it'll, it'll magically all work out. Um, so suppose uh, I'm evaluating a circuit, and, and I, I come to have this wire label B. And, and I come to learn that this is the wire label that I'm holding is actually encodes false. Usually I don't know what truth value I have. What if I somehow learn that I'm holding the false wire label? Um, and then I can behave differently based on whether I have true or false. That's the key. So if I know I have false, then I know I'm going to learn the false output wire label. So the, the garbler can just arrange, OK, if, if you learn that if you learn that you have a false wire label, here's an encryption of the false output wire label. And if you know that you have false, this is the ciphertext that you'll decrypt. If I know that I have the true wire label, then again, this is, becomes like an identity gate. And what I need to do is transfer the truth value on this A wire into the C wire. And I claim that it suffices for the garbler to give me this value A, X, or C. So let's see what happens. If I have the true wire label down here, and I have A, I'll decrypt the second ciphertext. I'll get A, X, or C, and that allows me to learn false here. I'm transferring the truth value from here to here. On the other hand, if I had the true wire label up here, I would XOR with A plus C. I would get the true wire label up here. Um, right, so I'm, I'm transferring the truth value along that top, uh, along, along that top line. Um, and then we'll use our standard trick. Instead of choosing C at random, I'll choose C to make this first ciphertext disappear. And now this just costs a total of one. So if somehow we can tell the evaluator what truth value he has on this wire, <coughs> then we can get away with one ciphertext. And what's interesting here is that the evaluator kind of does very different things based on whether he has uh, uh, the true or the false wire label. right? We need him to know because we're asking him to do different things in those two different cases. Okay, so that's bizarre. Like, what is the purpose of this? In the real world, no one knows what values are along these wires. Um, so, 
the, the insight is that we have a clever way of combining uh, these two types of half gates, we call them. So imagine you have an AND gate in the circuit. Uh, A and B are bits. Let's imagine that you introduce this extra bit R. The R XOR with itself is nothing. This is fine. I'm going to distribute the AND across the XOR, and I get this, uh, which makes no sense. Um, <coughs> what if the garbler chose the value R, and what if we somehow arrange for the evaluator to learn A plus R, which is a single bit in the clear. That means that this is an AND expression, and A XOR R is known to the evaluator. This is an AND expression, and R is known to the garbler. Right? And so that means I can garble this whole contraption. Uh, this left bracketed thing is one ciphertext. The right bracketed thing is one ciphertext. This XOR in the middle is free. It's free XOR because everything I did before was with free XOR. Maybe I forgot to mention that. Um, so you put these two halves together in this clever way. You get a uh, you get an AND gate. It's compatible with free XOR, and it only costs two ciphertexts total. And if you're wondering where these where this R thing comes from, you can actually basically get it for free. Everything that we're already doing includes this R. So if R is like the color bit of of false, for instance, then okay, the, the garbler certainly knows the association between colors and truth value. The garbler knows this color association. The evaluator knows the color of their own wire. And those two pieces of information are a secret share of the truth value. So the evaluator already has his own color bit. And, and you, can, you can collapse, you know, present it this way for educational purposes. You collapse it all together, express it in terms of the colors on the wires. And you get an AND gate that costs two in a way that's compatible with, uh, with free XOR. So, Jim, you already knew, uh, you already knew how, to, how to make it two ciphertexts before, but now you want to make it compatible with free XOR? Is that the point? Yeah, it's these two lines, right, that are, we could do two before, but not in a way that was compatible with free XOR. And yeah, now we did. Yeah. Right. So, before, I didn't like it because, like, these three things were. One of these three was best for different classes of functions. Now this is best. And the assumption is exactly like free XOR. <coughs> yeah, it's the exact same assumption as free XOR. So we're That's a typo. <laughs> it's an archaeological artifact of. Uh, that should say hash. They should all say hash. Anyway, same assumption. Steve? So, how many gates? Do you have any idea? Roughly, how many gates you will actually be in a position where you know one of your inputs? So obviously, the input gates, you know what your inputs are. But after that, how far can you propagate it normally? Well, well, this little gadget is for all of the internal. We introduce like these extra conceptual gates, where we've set it up so that you know one of the inputs. I mean, but also you could you could do these tricks at the input layer, if if you do some program analysis and say that oh someone will know what's on this wire. You can do that, but this is this is for an arbitrary AND gate in the middle of the circuit. We'll introduce these extra gadgets to make one person so one person learns a random bit that somehow helps the uh, helps use these little gadgets. So this is for for was that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's no more polynomial interpolation. So there's a totally different approach for. Which is polynomial interpolation, how did it compare to the cost of the hash or whatever? Because I would imagine it would be is it like really much cheaper? Um, I don't think anyone implemented it because I think Yehuda knows. Using the the new Intel instruction set has actually an instruction which helps you do finite field operations. Mm -hmm. And if you use that and highly, highly optimize everything, it's about half of a single AES operation. So it's not actually free. I mean, if you read it's account. not for free. Yeah. On top of the, and it's quite. It's not so easy to implement. It can, it's yes. not so difficult, but it's, it's about yes. half an hour. Yes. Yeah, Benny. Starting with the circuit about polynomial interpolation, just uh, linear combinations. You can replace yeah. polynomial interpolation. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <You're> magic. <laughs> Because you will have garblings in which a particular part of the input of certain 
part is randomness or it is uniformly at random, then you can optimize the circuit, approximate it, or you can use the circuit. That sounds like a great research question. You should join the dark side and <laughs> do variable circuits with me. What was the question? He wants to know if you can optimize some of this garbling stuff if you know that some of the inputs are going to be uh, randomly distributed instead of like worst case. Um, which is a good question. Um, I think I'm running a little low on time. Oh, so here's, here's my prediction, um, <laughs> right? Uh, someone in 2026 is going to put a new entry in this table. It's going to be all zeros, and then cryptography is going to be over. Um, <laughs> But actually, in our half-gates paper, um, we show that that's OK. That it, it, there actually is a, a, a floor to how, how good these can be, right? Uh, nothing is for free. Every, every construction that I showed you, uh, what kind of tools does it use in its toolbox? Well, it calls a symmetric primitive, uh, like a PRF or a hash function. And it uses linear operations like XOR or polynomial interpolation with, with fixed coefficients, so that's just a linear combination. Um, we proved that if you're only using these kind of operations, then you really do need to uh, garble an AND gate with two ciphertexts. So whether or not you're compatible with free XOR, just if you want to garble a single AND gate um, and you're allowed to do anything you like as long as it's one of these uh, linear operations, then you do need two ciphertexts. So like I'm, two is, the, is, the, is the, the floor of how efficient these things can be. That means that our half gates construction is optimal in terms of size. Right? So size is the parameter I care about for this talk. It's optimal among uh, schemes that use known techniques. This is our formalization of known techniques. Um, and schemes that work gate by gate in an XOR, an AND, and NOT basis. Right? You can't have an XOR better than free. And you can have an AND gate better than two. The NOT gates are also free, which I didn't mention. So that makes the half gates construction optimal, um, uh, you know, subject to these uh, restrictions. Is the theorem also only for uh, perfectly correct uh, carbon schemes? Or do you also look at uh, maybe there is some negligible probability of failure and then? The fact that things are linear means that if, you know, if these linear equations hold with noticeable probability, they probably hold with, that, with, with probability one. I, I didn't think about that in the proof, but I, I think it probably also covers the negligible error. Yeah. So all these optimizations look at one gate at a time. Is it possible that maybe if you look at sort of s several gates together, you could get something better? Like maybe you could do two cycle text, but two gates amortized or something like that? Ask the guy sitting next to you. <laughs> 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 um, that, Oh my goodness, what, where did this come from? So, so given, given this lower bound, you know, a lower bound shouldn't serve to like deter us from doing anything ever. It just points us to where we should look, you know, where we should break the rules now. And uh, right, one thing you can do is take a larger chunk of the circuit. Don't, don't express it as individual gates. Take a big chunk, garble that as a whole. Maybe you can do better. Uh, Valerio is giving a talk. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday uh, tomorrow um, about just that. Um, there's ways to do better than the half gates construction by, by taking this approach. Um, the lower bound was for uh, linear garbling schemes, and maybe there's a clever way to do nonlinear things. Like maybe you interpret a wire label as an element of a finite field and take its inverse or, or multiply two wire labels together. I, I, I don't know, but th that would be worth uh, looking into. Maybe things can be cheaper that way. Um, I, I put this up here just for the sake of completeness. I don't know if the, we, we have ways of garbling circuits that are asymptotically better, right? They have like additive overhead instead of constant overhead in the size of the circuit, but uh, these use heavy machinery and they, uh, I, it's not clear that those will ever break even in terms of things that you would want to implement. Um, not if you continue on this linear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, yeah. Um, and uh, the last thing, I don't think uh, I don't think the organizers are going to be much more time. How much more time do I have? Five minutes. Um, yeah, there's I can I can do this. <laughs> there's there's 
There's one more. Th uh, there's one more optimization that I think is really clever. It's uh, sometimes you observe that you're using garbled circuits, and you don't need the full, the full suite of security properties of garbled circuits. You actually need something slightly weaker, which can lead to a concrete improvement. So, the the what the example of I know that I know of is uh, is the zero knowledge proof uh, with uh, Claudio and others. Um, so Alice wants to prove a zero knowledge, uh, pr prove a, a statement in zero knowledge to uh, Bob. X is the witness. X is the instance, and W is the witness. And here's how you do it using garbled circuits. This is really elegant. When you teach Yao's protocol in your class, the next lecture you can teach this protocol. Uh, it's perfect. So the verifier generates a garbled circuit that checks the NP relation. Uh, so this is a this is a circuit with one output wire label. It's a single bit. Use OT to let the verifier pick up the, uh, the garbled input corresponding to the witness. Then, instead of announcing the garbled output, have the prover commit to the garbled output. That's like one wire label. You commit to that wire, that output. And from the verifier's point of view, the verifier is thinking, well, at this point, the prover knows a garbled circuit and knows a garbled encoding of uh, the witness. And so, if this commitment contains the true output wire label, that means he must have known a witness that causes the, the circuit to output uh, true. And this, this is the authenticity property of, of garbled circuits that I talked about much earlier. Uh, but why are we committing to it instead of just revealing it? Because the verifier might be corrupt. The verifier might have sent a, a bogus garbled circuit that leaks everything about the witness. So we have the verifier open the garbled circuit. And the prover will say that, OK, if this is the garbled circuit, if the garbled circuit was generated correctly, that means that the garbled output that I committed to, it reveals nothing about my witness. It just reveals the fact that the, the, the relation was true. Um, we sort of check the verifier for correctness. Um, and if it's correct, then we can open the garbled circuit, or open the, the, the garbled output. Everyone's happy. And the whole reason we can evaluate a garbled circuit and then later open it, open the same one, like that's kind of a, a thing that you don't see every day. It's because the prover knows the prover knows all the inputs to this circuit already. Right? The prover knows W. There are no secrets inside of this circuit. Right? So opening the circuit doesn't leak anything about, say, the verifier's input. The verifier didn't have any private input. The only property we needed of the garbled circuit was this authenticity property. In particular, we didn't need the privacy property. And so um, in a follow-up work, so Fredrickson, Nielsen, Orlandi observed that in this protocol, it's secure if you just use a uh, garbled circuit scheme with uh, only the authenticity property. And in fact, if you take out the privacy property, you can get a smaller garbled circuit. Um, you can get an AND gate that costs only one. Uh, for example, use the use one of our half gates from the half gates paper. So we already said if the evaluator of the circuit knows only one of the inputs to an AND gate, it can cost one. And in this, in this scenario, the uh, evaluator knows both. Uh, so, so this definitely uh, works. And it's you know, half, as, half as large, yeah. Don't you need the adaptively secure garbled circuit on the previous <coughs> Oh, yeah. I, I totally cheated in all of my things. In reality, you would do the OT first, and then the garbled circuit second. I, I, for some reason, this makes more sense to my brain, so I present it this way. But you're right. This this has an adaptivity problem, but you just exchange the order. You're right. Um, yeah. So this was. Oh. Uh, there's some subtleties that I didn't. Uh, there's a selective failure thing, so you need a committing OT. The way you open the garbled circuit is is by having this be a committed OT. You open up all the input wire labels. That's the way you open the circuit. And that ties it to the OT, and there's no selective failure. But yeah. the, the advantage is it's already negligibly soft. Yeah. Yeah, so there's details that I'm glossing over. You guys, I can't get anything past this audience, though. <laughs> um, OK, so in some settings, you only need the authenticity property. You can get even smaller. Um, uh, so that's interesting as well. So, uh, so that's that's it for my talk. I just want to go back and and uh, appreciate where we've been in the last 30 years. So I think garbled circuits have been a great success story for crypto. It's something we should all be proud of. Um, uh, 
the fact that AES circuit is 10 times smaller than it was in 1990, a garbled circuit. Computation is sped up by many orders of magnitude. I think it's a great success story. Um, and there's still cool things to discover. And uh, so I hope you all stop working on whatever you're doing and go work on garbled circuits. Uh, and that's the end of my talk, so thanks. Yeah, we're running, running a little bit late, so maybe we'll just go straight to the break.